Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. <clears throat> you know, one of the main reasons why the soul descends to this world, think about it, one of the main reasons why the soul descends from the spiritual world to this physical world is to learn Torah. When we learn Torah, we become one with God. God and the Torah are one. God took his infinite being is infinite wisdom condensed into a book form called the Torah. When we learn Torah, we become one with God and we illuminate and uplift the entire world. It says in Shema, Veshinantom Levanecho, Vedibarta Bom. You shall diligently teach them to your children and teach it to your children with a smile that they love it. Tragically, today, parents are not spending enough time with our kids. Our kids are spending hours on social media. We don't even know where our kids are going. The purpose of these Wednesday night webinars is that we should learn the Torah portion of the week. And we just started the Torah new. This is Parsha's Noyach, the second Parsha. So the purpose of these Wednesday webinars is that we should learn the Torah portion and learn how to give it over to our kids with a smile that they enjoy. So it's such a great honor to have Nick Rabinovitz with us this evening. I understand that this is Nick's first shiur. But if anybody knows how to put a smile on someone's face, it's undoubtedly Nick. And Nick, I love the beard. You're perfect for the job tonight. So it's an Thank absolute you, honor to have you. And Aaron, I'm going to ask if you could put it on the speaker view. But uh, thank you and thank you all for joining. Nick, over to you. Thank you. you. Uh, tell me where you guys are coming from. Good evening, uh, ladies and Jews, Red Sea pedestrians, Rabbi Masinta, Rabbi Sinchaya, all protocols observed. Is Rabbi Sinchaya with us? Is she, is she watching from another room, Rob? Watching, We've watching. Got a WhatsApp from her now. Um, Wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Rabbi, on this uh, auspicious occasion. <clears throat> it is, of course, the 26th of October, 2022, corresponding to the 11th of Cheshvan, 5783, 5783, corresponding to the total number of years that we as a Jewish people have suffered, which begs the question, haven't we suffered enough? Welcome uh, to what Rabbi Masinza calls a Zoom. This is a, this is a Zoom, Shi'ur, with Mina Krabinimitz, where we will be discussing as the rabbi said, we will be discussing this week's parsha, which is Noach, which coincidentally was my bar mitzvah parsha, uh, November the 4th, 1989. That's 33 years and one week ago. So I, I must just say that discussing um, a parsha is not, is not my idea of a dream gig, rabbi. It wasn't when I was 13, and it still isn't now. But as we all know, there's no saying no to Rabbi Dovi Masinta. I've actually given one drosha. Uh, Rob, you mentioned that this is my first ever shiur. I've given a drosha just over three years. Just before COVID, I was in Paul for Shabbos. I, was, I went to the Paul shul where obviously all the congregants uh, speak Afrikaans. Uh, I was, uh, uh, and uh, at the end of the service, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. The shamas tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Nick, na yigdal, as da brocha, kreivio is taki chala, da kheyevo as a drosh. Okay. People in Joburg, um, I don't know, I'll put that in the chat. I'll put the translation in the chat. Tell me where you're coming from uh, in the chat. Tell me where you guys are, what's happening. Uh, give me some feedback. I can't see a soul. I haven't done this. This is a great way of re-experiencing the PTSD of lockdown level five for me. Thank you, Rava. But from a DNA point of view, I'm very I'm very much at home giving uh, giving the straw show my uh, I'm, I'm from. Uh, I'm descended from at least uh, ten rabbis. Not my dad, Chaim. Not his dad, <coughs> Benjamin Leib. Uh, but the list does include my great grandfather, Rabbi Yosef uh, Shaul Rabinovich of Krekenava, Lithuania, and his father of Chaim Shlomo Rabinovitz of Zay Melis, and his father of Arya Leib Katzenellenbogen of Brest, and his father of Abraham Ben David Katzenellenbogen of Slutsk, uh, Brest Litovsk. And his father, Rabbi David Kassenelenbogen of Kedananai, and his father, Rabbi Yeska Kassenelenbogen of Baal Knesset, his son, and his father, Rabbi Abraham Kassenelenbogen Dayan of Breslitzov, and his father, Yaakov Chaim Kassenelenbogen of Lvov, and his father, and his father, going right back to his father, Achava of Moshe Ashkenazi of Neustadtl. We've only got 20 minutes for the show, so I'll have to stop there, but I think you get the picture. I say 20 minutes which might turn out to be 40 minutes but for me it'll feel like 40 days and 40 nights and seven days before i send out a raven and another seven days before the first dove and the seven days before the second dove 
uh, you have to show God you're ready, just not with a raven. Anyway, just like this week's uh, Torah portion, I'm also a bit unclear of the timeline. It says 20 minutes, who knows what we'll do. That's a joke that refers to this week's uh, parasha. The jokes have begun, everybody. Uh, so please pay attention, uh, Michelle Winkler. Well, we were, of course, um, I didn't make up any of those names in my ancestry. We were Katz and Ellenbogens until the 1700s. And we only became Rabinovitzes in the, in, the, in the 1700s. The Russians uh, forced us to get Russian surnames. Rabinovich, of course meaning the son of the rabbi that was uh, Yosef Shaul he was he was the son of uh, Chaim Shlomo and he was the first to get the surname Rabinovich the son of uh, the rabbi and then his son Benjamin Leib became Rabinovichovich the son of the son of the rabbi and then and then my dad Chaim uh, became Rabinovich or Vichovich and then he tried to open up a shop in the Makolat but the sign writer was charging by the letter uh, because he was uh, because he was also Jewish. I'm just getting a WhatsApp here from um, from Herzliya Principal Joss Horwitz, and she says, "I look the part." Thank you so much, Joss, for those words of encouragement. So let's get down to uh, this week's parsha. And I've still had not a single person in the chat. Can you people not use Zoom after Zoom after two and a half years? Anyway, uh, so about uh rabbi correct me if i'm wrong 1565 or 1656 years <clears throat> after the earth was created or roughly 4.5 billion years after the earth was created if you believe in science god said to noah um noah because the earth is filled with wrongdoing and corruption i'm going to destroy it and then as promised hashem got straight to it uh, there wasn't even time for like a Zondo commission uh, or any of that. And um, because Noah and his family were the only righteous people on earth, they were the only ones God allowed onto the ark. And so a week before the, the flood, God tuned Noah, listen, bro, in seven days, I will blot out everything in existence that I have made. Now go and get for the ark seven pairs of all the clean animals. And he also said two pairs of animals who are unclean. And you have to have the unclean ones on a long trip. It's because you get bored on the boat ride and you know how long journeys are with the whole family. Uh, in fact, Noah actually came up with two particular dad jokes on that trip that I use uh, to this day. Whenever kids ask me for a joke, I say, what's brown and sticky? And they go, I don't know. And then I go, a stick. And then they say, tell me another one. And I say, what's brown and, and sounds like a bell. And they say, I don't know. And I say, dung. And then they go, that's not funny. Uh, it all comes back uh, to Noah. Hence the unclean animals. So anyway, Noah did everything according to what God had commanded including building an ark that was exactly uh, 300 cubits, 300 uh, cubits long. Oh, I'm told the chat is actually closed. You can't say anything to me unless you WhatsApp me, but you don't have my number, so it's fine. 300 cubits uh, and the cubit, I don't know if you're familiar with this. My son, Ben, is actually, he's listening into this, uh, 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 Josh. It's his bar in a couple of months, so he's, he's got some learning to do. The cubit, Ben, is the crudest of all measurements. It is defined as the length between one's elbow and one's stretched out middle finger. Uh, and to this day, when someone cuts into my lane on the M1, I consider it a mitzvah to biblically measure them. Uh, anyway, in seven days, the, <coughs> the flood waters came upon the earth and all the fountains of the great deep were torn apart and the floodgates of the heavens were open. And on that very day, Noah and his family came uh, to the ark. And, and this, you won't find this in the, in the commentary, but, uh, or, or in, in uh, but it's in the, I forget if it's in the, the Gomorrah or where it is, but it took a while for them to get onto the ark because Noah's wives weren't sure if everyone had packed enough jerseys for the trip. So they had to go back and get a couple more just in case it got colder than expected. And you never know how long these things are going to take because that's what they would say. No, God likes to draw things out sometimes. Better to be prepared. Extra snacks aren't going to hurt anyone. Whoever got upset over, over catering on the puck course. And as we all know, uh, then all living creatures, two by two, uh, male and female, came uh, to Noah. And when they were all on the ark, God shut the door on their behalf. Uh, mainly because one of the wives was considering going back to get an extra pair of pajamas in case the nights got chilly and she had to double up. And also she'd forgotten her own pillow. <laughs> uh, so God decided best to just put a stop to all that fussing about and then the rain came guys and uh, and it came upon the earth uh, for 40 days and 40 nights covering the highest mountains and blotting out all living things so for and I quote uh, from the Torah so for 150 days and nights the water stormed and swelled um, all over 
all over the the land and uh you might have just noticed now the math doesn't quite check out here 40 days 150 it's not clear uh, we're not going to argue with hashem look what, what he did last time when he was a uh, grumpy so basically the rains fell <clears throat> for 40 days and 150 nights and with waters swelling above the highest of mountains all life was destroyed uh but for those on the ark however and this is critical however uh god of course remembered God remembered uh, Noah. That's what it says. God remembered Noah. He didn't for a while, but then he was like, oh, snap, I forgot about Noah. And then he caused, I quote, he caused a wind to pass over the earth. Now, if there are kids uh, watching, please, I'm going to resist the temptation to make a dad joke out of that, but you can picture it in your in the, in your mind. Uh, do I need to stop laughing at my own jokes? I don't know. I'm just finding them quite funny at the moment. After 150 days and 40 nights, <laughs> the Torah says, God then remembered Noah was there, which actually, when I read that, reminded me of the time I took our toddler, uh, Sophie, grocery shopping at Constantia Village. She was about one. And as I came out of the Woolies, I, uh, I remembered her and I was like, oh, my God, where's Sophie? And when I got to the car, I found her in the baby seat. She was fast asleep. And I woke her up and I said, let's not discuss any of this with your mommy. Uh, but obviously, I had to tell my wife, Debbie, about it. And so I did a few months ago. Uh, on Sophie's sixth birthday. I was actually also often forgotten about as a kid. You know, once I waited, Ben, once I waited outside at school until 8 or 9 p.m., that's never happened to you. My parents went out to dinner. And then uh, at about half past eight, my mom was like, where's Nicholas? And my dad was like, who's Nicholas? And my mom was like, Nicholas, our only child who hasn't been with us. We haven't seen for 40 days and 150 nights. Where is he? Uh, he's standing outside of the school, guys. Because cell phones hadn't been invented. And my dad was like, but it's Tuesday. Normally, he has a sleepover outside the school on Tuesdays, doesn't he? <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. I've actually forgotten about my Drosh accent. I'm supposed to. So anyway, so uh, anyway, and so forth, and uh, etc. And then, lo, God subsided the waters, and the flood was over. And the Torah tells us that the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat, which is the Hebrew word for what is now Armenia. Uh, there's actually a theory that Noah, Noah named the mountain uh, Ararat because of his son Ham's stutter. Uh, apparently, uh, Ham came to Noah and said, Dad, one of the rodents has gone missing. And, uh, and Noah said, a mouse? And he said, no, a, a rat. And that is where uh, Ararat, uh, he never stuttered again, Ham, apart from the time a week later when he, uh, when he saw his dad naked. But we'll get to that. So Noah, of course, Noah is Hebrew for, for rest as in after the flood, <laughs> the rest is history. Or maybe because it was only during the flood that Noah could finally rest. A bit like level five of lockdown. If this was his lockdown. He finally got to have a long nap on the ark. Uh, they were actually going to call him Schloff Cohen. That was Noah's surname, Cohen. They were going to call him Schloff Cohen, but it didn't have the same commanding ring as Noach. And so they went with Noach. But anyways, so they got there to Mount Ararat. And... Um, Thanks for the feedback, Rosie Popak. And uh, they got there. And, and then after another 40 days, because the timeline is very unclear here. In fact, one could say the Torah is, seems to be at peace with time being merely a construct. Uh, so God commanded Noah after another 40 days to send out a raven to test the waters because God was a big uh, Game of Thrones fan. And the raven replay, uh, returned because it could not find a place uh, to land. Ben, the model of that story is never send a raven to do a seagull's job. So some of you may be thinking, why a raven? Why not a homing pigeon? Why not send a different bird? But then he did send a different bird to find out if the waters had subsided. Uh, and he sent, he was thinking of sending a hawk. But as we all know in South Africa, the hawks are useless when it comes to investigating anything. So he decided to send a dove, which eventually returned with an olive beak in its a beak. We'll come back to the olive beak. But this time, the second time he sent the dove, uh, a week later, the dove did not return and no one knew that the waters had subsided or either the waters had subsided or the dove had drowned. Either way, it was time uh, to get off the boat. Like that time we all walked out of level five of lockdown into level four onto the, 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 the pavement. And so God commanded Noah uh, then to, uh, to, to, to come out of the ark and set all the animals free except for that one uh, escaped rat then and then so all the living beings human and animal birds and i quote i quote creeping things all the creeping things all that moves upon the earth uh went in their pairs out of the ark and and, and as far as i'm concerned this was a prime opportunity for hashem to get rid of 
the creeping things, which were obviously some kind of beta beta testing error on God's part. Uh, and I don't know why he didn't use the opportunity, but he didn't. And then Noah built an altar to God and offered um, karbanot, karbanot, the burnt offerings of every animal to thank Hashem. And um, I don't know if it's just me, but I don't think that helped set the animals free. Uh, but for God, it's the thought that counts a lot of the time. So now we can see that uh, that, that earlier when the dove brought uh, Noah the olive leaf, that 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 was a uh, actually that was a peace offering to avoid being a burnt offering. Now some of you may also be wondering, but hold on here, uh, Noah doesn't have enough animals to make uh, to be making offerings this soon. Okay, he needs to give the animals at least half a chance uh, to make more animals before he starts getting rid of animals. God has literally just wiped out all of the animals except Noah's pears. And here is Noah ready to permanently erase goats because he's in a good mood. What was the entire trip of the boat ride, my guy? Anyway, just out of interest, uh, if anybody knows the answer to this question, which breed of dog did Noah choose to take onto the ark? I assume... I assume you would have taken two Yorkies to save space, uh, but I I don't feel uh, I feel like he took a Maltese because they're they're more Jewish uh, than than the York. There are actually a lot of Jews from Malta. My my cousin Ian recently emigrated to Malta, and my uncle emigrated uh, to Spain uh, in 1990. And then I later found him. Your your great uncle, you never met him, Ben, but I found him 12 years later in a bar in the northwest of Spain in Galicia. Uh, with p actual pigs hanging from the ceiling. You must know how far you've strayed as a Jewish man when you were in a bar with actual pigs hanging from the ceiling. He'd even converted to Catholicism. He'd asked the rabbi for a foreskin replacement, and he'd said, no, we can give you a clip on. But that's another story for another Parsha. But basically, let's continue now with the story of Noah. After all the, uh, that, God vowed never again uh, to doom the earth. And he did that because of the burnt offerings, because of... Uh, the, uh, um, after smelling the pleasing odor of the bry, uh, that's what God promised never to do again, because a good bry can really have that effect on anyone, even Hashem and vegans. And then right away, God made the famous rainbow, which some commentators believe Ben was actually the rainbow flag, which he put in the sky to represent his covenant with man, as well as his future support for the LGBTQIA plus movement. But we're not exactly sure about that. But the rainbow in the sky apparently is far less um, for man than it is for God himself. So that when the rainbow appeared in the clouds, God would remember his own covenant with himself uh, and would never again let the, the flood destroy all flesh because God is all knowing and, every, and, and everything. But he has a lot of Taurus on his plate. So we, we, we allow Hashem to set reminders for himself. That was what the rainbow uh, was about. Now, of course, uh, we I mentioned, uh, made passing reference to the fact that Noah was the first man to plant a vineyard and partake of the vineyard. He produced the wine. And he became very drunk one day. Uh, he was so ungeschnosket that he took off all of his clothes and passed out. And then Ham, his son Ham, the unkosher son, uh, saw his drunken father naked. And that was a big no-no. And so Noah cursed Ham's son Canaan to be the lowest of slaves. Hashtag even Stephen. And I don't think we need to go too much more into that. Basically, the point was God punishes the wicked by causing a giant flood. And then, of course, uh, God saves Noah and his family so they could repopulate the world. Now, some of you may be thinking, so this is a story about how if you behave really well, God will let you do incest. But that is not what Hashem said. What Hashem said was, Noah, go now from the ark with your family and let all the animals and living things go out with you. Be fruitful and multiply. Go forth and multiply. Uh, that is uh, what, 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 and that is how we ended up with so many Jewish accountants. I'm convinced. He said, "Be fruitful and multiply," and, and that is a mitzvah that, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge Rabbi uh, uh, um, Kievman for. He has taken this very seriously. He's now on his eighth child, and I met Ari and Rebbe Simbatia at the Jewish Achievers Awards just after their first child. Uh, was born, which is how I know it's been eight years since uh, since I was asked to host the Jewish Achievers Award because they have a child every year to mark the anniversary. They are now on eight, so it's eight years since I've been asked to host the Jewish Achievers Award. Thank you for the reminder. Now, Hashem uh, then told the Cohens um, that all living animals and birds, and, and Ben is now walking out. I think he's, I've lost him. He's, Good night. He says, I'm not funny. Uh, all the living animals and the fish, all the moving things shall fear you. Uh, for like the plant vegetation, they are food to you. Never eat the flesh. This is what Hashem said. To, this is the point where I have to lift the and Never eat the flesh or blood of a creature while it is still alive. 
That's what he said. Except yogurt. And people don't, they miss this part. Rashi uh, says here, except yogurt, because that doesn't count. The, the probiotics are unmatched. And then God said there will never be a flood again to destroy the earth. Uh, just Florida. So get the hell out while you still can, Aaron uh, Masinta. And then of course, and that's that. That is basically, that is the Pasha. And um, after that, they, uh, they all lived happily. The Cohens, Noah and his family, all lived happily ever after until Noah died tragically at the age of 951. A week before his 13th uh, bar mitzvah, I think, I've, I think I've done. I went to a Waldorf school uh, when he did maths twice. I can't multiply a thing, which is why I haven't really gone forth and multiplied a little bit. But uh, if you take the first bar mitzvah at 13, the second is at 83, you multiply it by 11, you get roughly 940, something like that. So he died just before his 13th bar mitzvah, for which he was planning to take his whole family to the spur. It was a very sad event, but also a ripe old age, 950. That's an age. To, I mean, that, that's an age. Um, there's actually a theory, guys, that in the next 20 to 30 years, it'll be possible for all of us to live to that age because what scientists are exploring is a way to download our consciousness so that when we die, we can upload our consciousness into a new body. But then people wouldn't be afraid of dying. They'd be, uh, they'd be afraid of somebody taping over them before they'd had the chance to upload their consciousness into the new body. Can you imagine the inhumanity of being taped over like you would die and then they would plug you into the hard drive to reboot you and then all that would be there would be like five seasons of Game of Thrones. A bit like in the 1980s when we used to record Dallas on a Tuesday and then come back on a Saturday uh, to watch it on the VHS or the Betamax as my, as my uh, grandfather had it and then you would put the tape in and uh, listen, the opening bars would come on of Dallas, da 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 and then the snowy, and then you'd see uh, Rian Kreivach and the newsreader going, oh, hello, it's Rian Kreivach, and welcome, buddy, niece, and then dad would be like, who the hell recorded over my Dallas? And then we'd, you know, this is, that could happen. So you'd have to put, dads, you'd have to put stickers on your hard drives that said, like, dad's consciousness, don't delete. And then they would lose the hard drives maybe uh, after you died. But then and they could, but you'd back yourself up to the cloud. But then they'd still, they'd try to download you from the cloud, but they couldn't find your password. Can you imagine the stress of having to find the right uh, iCloud password? Otherwise, the consciousness, and then your family are trying to, and then they find the book where you scribbled all the passwords, but they can't read them. And then they're like trying all sorts of permutations. While well, he was a big Harry Potter fan, have you tried Griffin? door yes didn't work we've only got two more chances okay well what about the th three-eyed raven from game of thrones that didn't work what about habibi from fowder as absolute nightmare and then he's gone for good anyway in conclusion rabbi masinta uh told told uh, told me that hashem uh, told noah this is an interesting to incorporate uh, a tzohar a tzohar into the ark which is basically a sunroof or as Rashi calls it, a precious jewel that miraculously gave light. The significance of which is on a, on a, on a, on a, on a spiritual level, guys, is that from time to time, as, a, as, a, as humanity, we're going to go through an emotional flood of some sort. And, it, and, 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 and if we look at the Shoresh and the, 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 and the, 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 of the words, Taurus, Taurus can be transformed into Tara by opening up the Ark, Tever. Uh, just don't get when you open the Ark. This happened to me at the Constantia pop-up show once, where the Ark is just in a spot cupboard and then i opened the ark and then the, and then the curtain got stuck in 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 the cupboard uh but the tether and then the tzora made me jump into the the the, 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 the tzora the opportunity tzora uh, and then that's how you turn a curse into a blessing an obstacle an obstacle into an opportunity that is really uh the, at the heart of the crux of the nub of the gist of this of this week's uh parasha the, we've been through a flood covid has been our flood, the waters have subsided, and now we've reached our Ararat, and it's safe to step outside uh, without a mask, but not without a kippah. That's why I'm wearing um, this hat. And finally, I'd like to share uh, some wisdom, uh, not some wisdom really, but my just just, just um, reminiscences of my delivering this parsha on November the fourth, nineteen eighty nine. Uh, I remember it. Uh, I remember it very well. I particularly remember having invited. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, but my future wife Debbie was she was she was there she was uh, in the front row uh, in the, the balcony section at the at the reform shore which didn't have a balcony but uh, I looked across at her and I saw these little legs dangling uh, just above the floor she couldn't quite touch the floor I think this it might have been polio because this leg was a little bit I don't know what it was but this one was a bit longer than the other and I looked across at her and I and I saw an apparition of a young girl and I thought that girl 
is very short and um and we've been together pretty much ever since then that's, that's uh, 33 33 years together we we actually didn't talk for the first 16 years but in my mind uh we've we've always been together and um and and I, and I wanted to to share with you that it was almost not the case because I I almost um I almost got together with with an Afrikaans uh, woman at, at some point. I accidentally kissed an Afrikaans woman after a show once many years ago, um, just before COVID. Uh, they are the original super spreaders. They kiss everybody on the mouth, Afrikaans people. But I declined that. Uh, she offered me an opportunity, and I declined it because I I've, I've have a history of declining opportunities that goes back to uh, actually grade one, guys. I was at a Waldorf school. I was the only Jewish kid there. It was uh, it was the school play, The Nativity, and I thought I was going to play the baby G. Jesus, but they said no you can play the donkey which upset me a great deal and i said why the jew why the donkey they said it was a jewish donkey and you have to bray uh when the, the donkeys normally go oh, 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 eep, but this one is a eep, bro, because it's a jewish donkey and i was like that's that's lame but i i played the donkey and i fell in love with jane baker uh who had the most amazing moves not in that uh, particular play because she was a tree but but afterwards at break time and i didn't make a move on her until my friend peter ainsley's ninth birthday party at sequel where uh, we played a game of kiss catch, which uh, there are young people watching kiss catch uh, was banned in the in the in the early 2000s. It's now there's another game called catch request consent kiss, which isn't as much fun. But that's what we were playing. And Joan Baker caught up to me at the reeds next to the flay. And she caught me and she said, Well, this is your opportunity. And I said, For what? And she said, It's kiss catch. We've done the catch. What, what do you what do you think is next? She was very aggressive for a nine year old. And I said, No, thanks. Because I knew in my heart, Joan Baker wasn't Jewish, even though I at that point, didn't really know we were Jewish because there were no obvious signs. I was growing up on a farm uh, with the Chateisim. We didn't. There were no obvious signs. We were Jewish. We 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 uh, we had small straightish noses. We were not financially well off. We were celebrating Christmas with the Chateisim. There was only one thing at the urinal. To, to there was just one. Thing I used to look across at Peter Ainsley and think, why does his have a turtleneck and mine looks like an inquisitive one-eyed meerkat? And then on my 12th birthday, my dad sat me down and said, boy, there's something we need to tell you. And I said, oh my God, I'm gay. And he said, no, you're Jewish. Uh, it was very uh, traumatic. And I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we've got to take you, it's your barmy next year. We've got to take you out of this school and move you to another school where you can socialize with other meerkats and you need to go to Cheda. And I didn't know what Cheda was. I said, what is Cheda? They said, it's a Sunday school for Jews, but on a Saturday to mess with your mind. And I got to the Cheda and, and they put me in a, they had to fast track me. So I started off with five year olds. The entire class was five. I was 12. It was like an episode of Jewish Gulliver's Travels on Netflix, which doesn't exist, but I think should. And I, and, and within six months, I was, it was my barmy. I was up there on the 4th of November 1989 singing um, the opening bars of Mahaftara I remember very clearly singing Rani Akara which I thought at the time was Hebrew for getting the T-Rex in the ark was a nightmare for Noah but it didn't actually uh, mean that and then it was uh, it was great it was a wonderful thing it was a lot of nachos it was fun just the after party was a real disappointment because you're not guaranteed to have the after party you want because I was comparing it to um, to YZ Wise Glasses after party the week before at Kenilworth Center where they took us to play arcade games and I didn't know how to play arcade games because I come from a Waldorf school I had a different set of life skills if they'd asked me to play the recorder or, or plant a vegetable garden or crochet my own underpants or knit a felt elephant I could have done that but I didn't know how to play arcade games so when she gave us 20 rand Mrs. Weisglass in old one rand coins and said go wild on the arcade games everybody I took that entire 20 rand home with me not just because I didn't know how to play arcade games uh but also because i just discovered uh i was jewish so i took that money home and invested it in in bitcoin and that's why i'm actually doing this shiur for a fraction of my normal rate so thank you uh that is um uh, that is almost the end of of, of the zoom uh rabbi Masint, i think uh i think the lesson there are many lessons uh from from this parsha uh but i think um i think one of the key ones is is to be grateful for the obstacles we've uh, surmounted over the last two and a half years we've been through all sorts of emotional floods and we are all still here uh, i finally seen your chat i didn't see it this whole time thank you so much everybody we're finally uh we've made it through and there's a lot to be grateful for and um one of the things that i'm uh, most grateful for every day is that i'm a jew and uh, and not uh, a Jehovah's Witness. I, I just think that's something we can all be grateful for, not being Jehovah's Witnesses, enduring a lifetime of uh, can you, a rejection. Can you imagine, uh, ladies and Jews, can you imagine uh, 
how traumatic it was for Jehovah's Witnesses during level five of lockdown. They knew for the first time in their history that all of us, that everybody was home and, um, and they still weren't allowed to visit. So thank you very much. Thank God. Please God. Baruch Hashem. Amen. Tut, tut, tut. It's been wonderful, Rav. Nick, thank you so much. And you always put a smile on someone's face. As you know, the Gemara says somebody puts a smile on somebody's place, on somebody's face has a special place in the world to come. But uh, what I want to say is, you, as you correctly said, this week's parish is about turning obstacles into opportunities and trouble into bracha. And we have to realize that we have to make a difference to ourselves and to the world. And we're going to, I'm asking everybody who has kids at school, we have a special program on at the moment. If you have a, a kid at school, and uh, you'll commit to spending a few moments, a few minutes every week learning the parasha with them. This is a parasha book. You sign up for it, you will get uh, a free parasha book, and you will have insights into the parasha. I don't agree with every one of uh, Nick's insights, all of the insights, but nonetheless, the, 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 the power of people coming together, learning and sharing this knowledge with our, our kids. Please, guys, as a result of this, bring Torah to this world. We should have the ultimate bracha of all. No more floods, no more tzoros. We should have the ultimate bracha, the revelation of Mashiach immediately. And uh, we've just we just started the month of Cheshvan, so good chodesh to everybody, but Mashiach now. Thank you, Nick.